I were pounding through seven woes. Actually, there's a, an eighth one in there someplace in Luke and Mark that's not listed in Matthew, yet some manuscripts put it in there, later manuscripts. But um, Jesus spoke about the fifth woe. Okay, woe five. 23, 25 to 26. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish, so that the outside of it may also be clean, may, may become clean also. All right. Now we're looking at Bible knowledge commentary, and a short little paragraph here. The fifth will emphasize the hypocritical nature of the Pharisees. They were concerned with ex external cleanliness, such as the outside of the cup and the dish from which they would eat. That's how they dressed, too. But inwardly, they were filthy. But in their hearts, they were greed and self-indulgence. The cleansing was primarily for the sake of being seen by men. The outside garments, and the phylacteries, and so on. But they were not above robbery and excesses in their own lives, their own personal lives. You got to be an example in your own personal life if you're going to teach morality. You better be moral yourself, and this is teach from the, the uh, law of Moses, which had all kinds of uh, rules and regulations that you were to abide by it in order to be a, a good teacher of it. If cleansing would take place internally, their outside would also be affected. That's what Bible knowledge commentary says. Now let's see what expositor says. They tended to digress. The most common interpretation of these verses is that Jesus begins with a metaphor of the cup and dish, reveals his non-metaphorical concerns in the words of verse 25, then returns to his metaphor in verse 20. I don't know where to get this. Let's go back and see. We're looking at all five on my worksheet here, which I can change. Well, three. Woe 5. Look at expositors. Let's see if I can get it. Oops. I don't spell it right. I'm not going to get it right. W-O-E-F-I-V-E. -E. Okay. Go backwards. There it is. Okay. Look at expositors. Now, I don't like... Maybe I, I looked at this. Here it is. Yeah, see, now three, three dots here. I read through expositors. I didn't like what I just read. Here's my worksheet. I took it out. The Pharisees have been occupied with external religion instead of that of the inner person. All this nonsense here. The most common interpretation of these, I don't care what the most common interpretation of them, what's the correct interpretation? It says, I took all of that out because I don't need to discuss things that aren't in view. Two people are arguing about what the verse means. I don't want to hear it. What did Jesus say and what's an accurate observation of what he said. So let's go back to my worksheet. The Pharisees have been occupied with external instead of that of the inner person. Within themselves they remain full of greed and self-indulgence. I accept that's good. That's that's there. The Greek akrosia found in the New Testament only here and also in, in 1 Corinthians 7 5. I, I'll leave that in. You know you want to see what the words say in various passages but the problem is the context of each individual passage might Alter the meaning of the word, the available meanings of the word, which one is the correct one that best fits the context. Anyway, in the metaphor, cleaning the inside is basic and guarantees cleanliness of the outside. So we don't digress about how people are arguing about this passage. What's the proper observation according to the normative rules of language, context, and logic? That's the problem with commentaries. They love to digress. So just take out it what you need and just put the other stuff aside. Blind Pharisee, that phrase, in verse 26, the singular has generic force. It says, the one who came to save his people from their sin, first clean the inside, that's with Jesus, and then the outside also will be clean. Inside does not here encourage privatized pietism, but total moral renewal in terms of justice, mercy, and faithfulness. The outside, the bits of religious observance easily seen by men, will then take care of themselves. Let's take a look at the verses again. This is what Jesus said. See, look at the words and then come up with your interpretation that applies directly to the words and that's somebody else's interpretation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, Jesus said. Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, 
but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. He's referring personally to them. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish, so that the outside of it may become clean also. So that's, see, succinct. Now we go to woe six. I'm staying on my worksheet because I went through this last night and filtered out the stuff that would be confusing or out of context. Woe six. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you, too, outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Very similar to five. <coughs> so, Bible knowledge commentary. They're, they're shorter than expositors. Sometimes they're spot on. In the sixth woe, Jesus continued the thought of the previous statement about external purification. The fifth woe stressed their actions. The sixth, their appearances. Oh, okay, good, good point. He called the teachers of the law and the Pharisees whitewashed tombs. A custom then was to keep tombs painted white on the outside so they would appear beautiful. But inside the tombs was the decaying flesh of dead people. Similarly, while the Pharisees appeared beautiful on the outside because of their religious conformity, they were corrupt and decaying inside. They were full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Uh, Anomias actually literally means nomias is law. A nomias is lawlessness, not lawful. So expositors, what does it say here? Be careful with, it's a great, I would get it and use it. You can get it online. But the problem with that is they do a lot of digression. During the month of Adar, just before Passover, it was customary to whitewash with lime, lime graves or grave sites that might not be instantly identified as such in order to warn pilgrims to steer clear of the area and avoid ritual uncleanness from the contact with corpses. Even nearby, it was considered unclean, and you had to go and do ceremonial washings. Such uncleanness would prevent participation in the Passover, because you have to take some time off, go into a quarantine, so to speak. But in that case, whitewashed tombs would not have been objects of beauty, which looked beautiful on the outside, but of disgust. They were places to be shunned which mentions neither whitewash nor beauty. Luke, well, some of this stuff is peripheral. I may have to sort some of this out again. Jesus is saying, notice my three dots there. So I quote expositors, put three dots in there where I don't, don't uh, want to include it for whatever reason. Jesus is saying that the scribes and Pharisees are sources of uncleanness just as much as the whitewashed graves are. All men are sinful. In the context of Matthew 23, the point Jesus is making is not that the scribes and Pharisees were deliberate and self-conscious hypocrites, but that in their scrupulous regulations, which they editorialized, they appeared magnificently virtuous, but were actually contaminating the people with their bad teaching. This woe parallels the second. The supreme irony is that their preoccupation with the, their law, nomos, left them steeped in anomia, lawlessness, a general term for wickedness. If you're lawless, you're wicked. But which may here suggest that their fundamental approach to the law was in fact plain lawlessness. They were doing it to aggrandize themselves. Well, it's a little bit, I like what Bible Knowledge Comedy says more directly, commentary. Woe seven, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous. And say, if we have been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partners with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Wow. Okay. Well, let's see what they were doing with Jesus. So you testify against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up, then, the measure of the guilt of your fathers. <clears throat> they said, well, if we were back there, then we wouldn't have done the same thing. Really? Bible knowledge commentary. The other verses. You always keep the verses in, in sight, the actual words, to make sure that Something isn't being twisted. The final woe also emphasized the religious leader's hypocrisy. They spent time building tombs and decorating the graves of the righteous. They were quick to say that if they had lived in the time of the prophets who were slaughtered, they would never have been involved in shedding the blood of those righteous men. God spoke directly to these prophets who then wrote the information down and wrote there and spoke it out to the people. So God was using them as instruments of his righteousness to speak it out. And they were murdered for that. Jesus knew that they were already in the process of planning his own death. By that act, 
they would demonstrate that they were just like the former generations who murdered the prophets. By rejecting the prophet, they would be following in the footsteps of their forefathers and filling up their ancestors' sin. Bible Law's commentary says this, Herod led the way in tomb building to atone for his attempts to plunder them. Jewish building was more likely to be commemorative. By erecting monuments, the religious leaders thought themselves morally and spiritually above their forebears and who had persecuted the prophets whose monuments they were now building. That doesn't make up for what they did in the, their ancestors did in the past. Build a, that doesn't mortify, help them either. They believe that they would not have joined their forebears in murdering the prophets. Just as many Christians today naively think that they would have responded better to Jesus than the disciples or the crowds that cried crucify him. I'm not so sure I would say I wouldn't say the same thing with all the pressure they would have around because if you're on his side you're liable to be uh, stoned yourself. <clears throat> but the distinction that the Jews drew draw in verse 30 Jesus now denies. Their own saying not the tomb building testifies against them. They speak of their forefathers and so acknowledge themselves to be the sons or descendants of those who shed the blood of the prophets. But Jesus sees further irony here. Based on the ambiguity of fathers and sons, the Jews think in terms of their physical descent. Jesus responds by saying, in effect, that they are sons all right, more than they realize. They're sons of the immoral actions. They show their paternity by resembling their fathers. They're already uh, conspiring to kill him. While piously claiming to be different, they are already plotting ways to put an end to Jesus. <clears throat> so the conclusion is defiant and ironical. The idea behind the measure of the sin is that God can only tolerate so much sin, and then, when the measure is full, he must respond in wrath. So it's just a matter of time, and there was. And then we go to A.D. 70, where all of Jerusalem was destroyed by Rome. <clears throat> There's only so far that God will go. Gives you plenty of chance by his grace. And then here comes the wrath. So, conclusion to this. Here are the verses. Matthew 23 and 33 to 36. Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees, You serpents, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of hell? He's telling them that they're not preaching the gospel and they're under condemnation already. Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them will, you will kill and crucify. Speaking of his disciples, which are very close when once he ascends and the church begins. And some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, which they did. <clears throat> so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly now it will be, truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation because of the disciples and the church. <laughs> Bible Knowledge Comedy says, In severe language, quite severe, Jesus condemned the religious leaders, calling them snakes and a brood of vipers, whose eternal destiny was hell, <clears throat> the place of eternal punishment. The evidence that they were deserving of hell would be their continual rejection of the truth. The evidence that they were deserving hell would be continual rejection of the truth. The Lord promised to send them prophets and wise men and teachers, but the leaders would reject their words and even kill some and flog and pursue others. Which we read, in the, especially in the book of Acts, that's what happens, what happened. And, and of course, in Paul's letters, their response to the proclaimed truth would justify the judgment coming on them. Abel was the righteous martyr mentioned in the Hebrew Scriptures in Genesis 4.8, and Zechariah was the last martyr, 2 Chronicles 24.20-22. 20 2 Chronicles being the last in the Hebrew Bible. In this statement, Jesus attested the Old Testament canon. In 2 Chronicles 24, Zechariah is called the son of Jehoiada, whereas in Matthew, he is the son of Berechiah. Same, same person. This forward here, fix a little typo. Son of, by the way, can mean descendant. Thus, Jehoiada, being a priest, could have been Zechariah's grandfather, or Jesus may have had in mind the prophet Zechariah, who was the son of Berechiah. Zechariah 1:1. 1, 1. On that generation of Jews who were guilty because they were following their blind leaders, they would fall God's judgment for their involvement in shedding innocent blood. 
So you can't just stand by as a bystander. The Lord was anticipating the nation's continuing rejection of the gospel. 